Welcome to the Agna YouTube channel. Today, we are bringing you another installment of character design analysis, where we work backward from official character art and build a retroactive video concept sheet through educated inference. Before we get into it, let's just say thank you to so many thoughtful comments on the last video. This is a new channel and it was so encouraging to engage with insightful and respectful dialogue that sincerely furthered the ideas we proposed. Thank you. So who better to follow up a region's champion than its professor? Today's video is all about director Clavel. Like in the last character analysis, we're breaking it up into sections of 1. Comparison. 2. Pose. 3. Costume. 4. Details. And 5. Inference. For the sake of future proofing, please be advised that this video was made just after the release of Scarlet and Violet's base game, and just days before uploading this video, the DLC was officially announced. But it hasn't had too much bearing on the script. That means our general context is using analysis to inform educated inferences on his depictions in subsequent media like the anime, DLC, and spinoffs. This video is made as an educational critique. We are not making moral assessments of any individual based on how they represent themselves. We are using the traditions of character design techniques in the hopes of distilling the intentions of the character designer. This is not a criticism of Clavel, nor is it a criticism of the artist. It's a demonstration of how to express character identity with the general intention of being a reference point for our own creative processes. All right, part one. Comparison. Director Clavel subverts expectations immediately, where in any other generation, we would recognize him as the equivalent to Professor Oak, Rowan, or Birch. He technically is not this generation's professor. That title is reserved for Turo and Sada. No, Clavel is the director of the Academy. In some ways, it seems like a lateral position. Turo and Sada don't seem to answer to Clavel. Their research is independent. But many other professors of subjects other than Pokemon do report to Clavel. Clavel's uniqueness is further distinguished given that he has two versions of his official character art. As the school he is the director of changes with the game. Not only does he have two versions, but he also has an alter ego. This alter ego, Clive, definitely teeters on the absurd, but this is far from the first Professor alter ego. Professor Kukui had the masked royal persona, while Professor Oak not only had his Alolan version, but also an imposter, even if he was only partially implemented. It's nice that this personality quirk has been repeated in professors since generation one, and each time has been so distinctly motivated. But as an FYI, we will be looking at Clive after we finish Clavel's two basic versions. Aside from professional comparisons, physically speaking, there's a strong chance we already know a handful of his relatives. His bone structure and hair pattern make a strong case to being a descendant of Dao Hua, Yui, and Choi from Legends Arceus. Oftentimes, Hisuian relatives were of distinctly different ages, than their easter egged descendants. So given that both Tao Hua and Clavel are older gentlemen, it feels like this connection was intended to be pretty transparent, or maybe we're just conflating old men. All right, time to get into part two, pose. Clavel's stance is built around his peripheral vision. Clavel is mid-glance, but looking to his left, Without having played the games first, we might have been suspicious of him, as body language experts have worked diligently to tether looking to the left with dishonesty. But when the games are played, we can better understand this posing to more likely indicate he is suspicious of someone else. This feels like a moment in time, a snapshot. We're willing to posit that the moment in question is just after the player has battled their first Team Star grunts, like he was listening just off screen. He is looking out for his students. While he is generally jolly, this expression has a sternness, a feigned disapproval of what he's eavesdropping on. While it's bold to claim the exact moment this pose was formed, 
We know that his concern for Team Star is his active status at the start of the game. His hand reaching up to adjust his glasses are a necessity, as their arms are so thick his peripherals are obstructed, requiring him to either adjust his glasses or turn his whole body. To remain discreet, he's choosing to adjust his glasses. So this raised hand has a practical application, but let's consider it conceptually. Simply by nature of his hand calling attention to his temple, he is making a gesture of intellect, of thinking and contemplation. But as a professor to gifted children, this mental moment is making a strong connection to another esteemed geezer. Where Gita used a single pinky finger to adjust her necktie with exacting precision, Clavel's pinky is slightly slumped forward, out of formation with the rest of its peers. This comparison demonstrates a distinction. Both are precise individuals, but with varying physical mastery. The gesture might also allude to a salute, but perhaps not as a suggestion that he has a military background, but more like he runs a tight ship, so to speak. His other hand is resting at his side. His fingers aren't being naturally pulled down by gravity. Instead, they're about a quarter of the way to a balled up fist. From the lines leading to his knuckles, we can infer an arthritic quality. Like his hand's resting pose is dictated by the tightness of his tendons, or he is actively resisting the urge to use a cane. Clavel's tender bones seem to be coming through in his core section. His shoulders are thrust back in a sort of defiance of what might be an inclination to hunch. His hips are thrust forward, as if compensating for a displaced center of gravity. At the same time, his almost performed aloofishness could be interpreted as a fit check, as he pivots slightly to make sure his details are being flaunted. Identifying how his age affects his pose is in no way meant to age shame. If anything, he has the best posture in the game. His shoulder blades are tucked back with a poise indicative of formal etiquette training. He's not some feeble old man. He's an extremely active, mobile, energetic, and graceful gentleman. But at the same time, the condition of his skeletal system adds a certain flavor to every elegant movement. Speaking of fit checks, let's get into part three, costume. We'll start with the fact that his two versions are distinguished by the color of his blazer, each representing the respective school. The jacket itself is sporty. It's like a professionalization of a tracksuit in accordance with fundamental haberdashery. Only a single button is buttoned. This is both proper and practical, as Shirley Clavel wants maximal range of motion. Where the chain of a pocket watch might be, Clavel instead is showing off some Pokey World accessory, hooked Pokeball holsters. These are all premier balls, which could be an indicator that his team of Pokemon was assembled later in life, when he had the means to catch each in such a specific receptacle, or that he got them during some special commemorative event. While partially covered by his jacket, his pants are definitely hiked up pretty high on his waist. While we have come to know and love such styles as mom jeans, the basic principle that Clavel has held on to his best pieces and waited for them to come back into fashion again feels fitting. Like he maintained a quiet self-assurance that his taste is timeless and quality clothes are worth keeping. Clavel wears no socks or no-show socks. It's a quiet rebellion, a uh, I'm not like other professors wearing converses to prom kind of move. There's a certain practicality to it, like he could whip off his kicks and enjoy Paldia's sunny shores in a flash, but also quickly hop back on the boat and resume his meeting with the Academy's biggest donors. If we circle back to the idea that his hand might be mimicking a salute, there's a chance that these white pants are a reference to a sailor's uniform, but they also might be tied to a retiree's tennis whites. Most exciting for callow stands is Clavel's undergarment. It seems to be some kind of leather alternative, 
something weatherized and waterproof like seal hide, but developed with a technological precision. It seems closest to the jumpsuit worn by Professor Toro, but minus any luminous neon line work. What makes this exciting for Kalos fans is the collar, which blossoms outwards with fur lining. It's likely flaffy wool, or maybe the cotton of an Eldegoss or Jumpluff, but that shape doesn't that remind you of a certain champion? That's right, good old Alan. This isn't necessarily some proof of being relatives, but more likely suggests both A-listers patron the same top-tier fashion houses of this pseudo-European landscape. If anything, the insulation of this fur lining adds more proof to the hunch that Clavel hails from the Sino region, the coldest climate to date. Upon closer inspection of the gameplay footage, it's surprising actually appears to be the same linen-like material of his jacket. It even has a seam. That seam legitimizes the collar as intentional. Otherwise, the linen texture might present as an economic reuse of an asset used in place of a more obvious but harder to light slash render wool. With the seam, it suggests a profound level of in-world craftsmanship, like the fashion house that produced this garment took great care to invoke a specific Pokemon that inspired them. This white fur matches his white pocket square, which he presumably uses to wipe his equally matched white spectacles. Let's look at those glasses. They're trendy. They're like Iris Apfel or Yayoi Kusama or Kurt Cobain. Glasses are a visual shorthand for being academic, bookishness stereotyped as vision impairment from too much reading. But wire-framed glasses could have been chosen, and their implied fragility could have pushed Clavel as precious, an ivory tower type. But instead, we have these thick white frames. By calling such attention to his glasses, he is unashamed in the fact that he needs them. And furthermore, given that his whole outfit is tied together by matching his white hair, he is altogether unapologetic of his advanced age. He is a sincerely fashionable person, dressing to feel comfortable, dressing appropriately for his job, dressing in a way that might be chastised or scrutinized, and tying it all together. Clavel is a cool dude, if cringy for his earnestness. New challenger! <clears throat> Let's look at Clavel's alter ego. Clive. The fundamental conceit of Clive is that he may fool the average poker world citizen, but simultaneously is easily identified by the player as a comically pathetic excuse for disguise. It's a how do you do fellow kids. It's fun, and like we said before, a nice new spin on this professor's alter ego trope. If you scratch the surface, this tongue-in-cheek approach is carried through. Clavel's self-assurance in his own timelessness has betrayed him. He's not dressing like one of his pupils. He's dressing like when he was one of his pupils. Or more specifically, he's dressing like one of the bad boy cool kids of when he was one of his pupils. His pompadour is a reference to squawkabillies, sure, but also their namesake, rockabillies. The zipper of his uniform is a massive gold medallion, like some sort of discotheque bling. That influence is pushed by how very pointed his collar is, how unbuttoned the shirt is, and his bell-bottom sleeves. He might think his shorts make him look more boyish, but they only reveal his knobby knees. A nice detail is that his hair is a totally different color when he's Clive, but is totally believable as the yellow tones of his bottom layers flipped up to be revealed. It's also a believable length. It's just nice that he doesn't have to carry around a wig. The color of his roots seems to match the lenses of his transition glasses. There isn't any official character art released for Clive, so we can't really see the finer details of like a zipper, but that medallion seems to have some sort of symbol on it. At minimum, it looks like a Pokeball, but we're keeping tabs on that. Having introduced Clavel's alter ego, let's officially mark this as part four, detail. 
In section one, pose, we theorize the exact moment this image would have been captured. In terms of lighting, it has the atmosphere of noon 30, almost direct sunlight, a short while after he delivered his greeting speech. There's a certain honesty to that lighting, the feeling that all is revealed in the harsh light of day. It's a little tangential for this character art, but let's talk about his team. His three guaranteed Pokemon are Oranguru, Abomasno, and Poltegeist. Notably, pulling the thread of his appreciation for his own pitch white hair, each of these Pokemon too heavily features the color white. Oranguru, the sage Pokemon, is a dead ringer for an academic professional. Poltegeist is a natural fit, as we can recall he had tea the first time we met him. You know, when the principal just showed up to your house on the first day of school and was like, Hey sport, I'm gonna hang out with your mom for a minute. Go ahead and pick yourself a Pokemon. So uh, yeah, Poltegeist is great. While Abomasno is a great fit for the facial hair, the fact that he's likely to also carry an Amoongus makes doubled grass types a bit suspicious. One can't help but wonder if Drampa was just available in the game. Might he have one? Granted, that might have acted as a red herring and unintentionally insinuated he was a lowland. So, Commander Komodo, Tomato Tomato. The fact that he is guaranteed to have the starter that's a better type matchup to your own suggests a few things. For one, having one of the starters could mean that he wouldn't expect his students to learn a lesson he himself wouldn't take like a good educator, but also that he's intended to represent a challenge. This might be why Guido was comparatively lacking in difficulty compared to other champions. It feels like Guida and Clavel and Cassiopeia were all a little less difficult to spread out the difficulty between them. But that would only really be felt if the player were forced to battle each of them back to back because healing is just so much cheaper these days. Anyway, we're way off topic. Let's talk about his Amoongus. It's nice to imagine Clavel leading a field trip into the woods and giving a lecture from this podium-esque dude. Let's bring the detail section back around and point out that Clavel could have styled his bang-like bangs, for bangs after the pointed protrusions of a hound doom. In the big picture of detail as a concept, it's worth pointing out that Clavel is a vessel to demonstrate graphic quality improvements. As the narrator and guide to the opening cutscenes, he's the most worthwhile to invest the most resources developing. The sequence takes the time to highlight the woven textures of his jacket, with the gentle sun bouncing off in a naturally scattered way. The richness of his fashion sense is intrinsic to his narrative function. Part 5. Inference. Okay. Now that we've extrapolated all the details we can, let's take those interpretations and make some educated inferences. Where Gita represented a temporal tension through being lit during some sort of twilight, Clavel repeats the theme of temporal tension by being a senior citizen with a youthful spirit. His charm is in his rejection of hiding his age, working with it instead. This embrace of aging makes him a good fit to befriend Diantha, who held similar sentiments and could have very well been educated in Paldia, maybe a major donor to her alma mater. Clavel is the product of elite international education. Perhaps it was decided he would pull from four notable Hisuians to push that very point. As if Choi and Yui's business really took off and established them as early tycoons of Sinonian business dynasties. His tracksuit inspirations and Clive's invocations of discotecas point to a, a youth of... Uh, what's an acceptable way to say this? Uh, Euro trash party boy? Do we not say Euro trash anymore? Sorry in advance, we love skins. Here's a prediction. Clavel will have a special connection to Giacomo. He will see in Giacomo a young version of himself. Talented, fun, likes dark types. But this prediction is based on the assumption that Clavel was a disco king and Giacomo is a DJ. Let's say they'll bond over successful party planning. Maybe Giacomo's laptop will be ideal to pivot to semester schedule management as he becomes Clavel's right hand. 
If we go back over our notes on Pose, perhaps Clavel's perfect posture is a byproduct of his passion for ballet or ballroom dancing. Most character designs stagger the feet as an opportunity to scale details, but the degrees of their pivot combined with his squared shoulders seem to make a pattern hinting at a history in dancing. So let's expect him to offer not only academic lessons, but also education in arts and culture. Okay, here's another prediction. And maybe we're getting into headcanon territory. We're willing to risk that accusation. But we have a hunch that Clavel is Malva's father. Malva famously had a partially incomplete storyline an Elite Four member who never really answered for being the spokesperson to Team Flair. So connecting her to Clavel might be some long due character development. Maybe Malva getting caught up with Team Flair is why Clavel is so invested in breaking up Team Star. Their connection is pushed by both using Hound Doom, both having tinted glasses, and if Clavel's ancestors had any connection to the Pearl Clan, that might be the explanation for Malva's pink hair. And Malva Clavel, think about her. Oh, and let's tie all these wild assumptions together. Why don't we? Malva's fellow Colossian Elite Four is Wilkstrom, who seems to have a suspiciously similar haircut to Giacomo. So maybe this hunch Clavel will have an affinity for Giacomo will intersect with a storyline involving Wilkstrom and Malva. A wild, wild assumption for sure. But if this shakes out, the gloating will be glorious, spectacular, breathtaking. Let's wait and see. Here's a prediction separate from interpersonal dynamics. There's something about the school that leaves a lingering suspicion. Why are there two different schools? How will they pick which one he's the director of in the anime? Will they combine them and just call it the Uva Naranja Academy? If he can't lead both, will they split the difference and make up a fresh third school? Here's our theory. It used to be the Uva Naranja Academy, but due to temporal disruptions, the timeline split the school into parallel universes. It's almost certainly not going to be reverted back to the original Uva Naranja Academy in the DLC, but perhaps the anime will deal with endgame levels of multiversal corrections. Clavel's Amoongus raises an eyebrow. It's an opportunity for him to have a connection to Area Zero's brute bonnet. Perhaps Clavel is the very educator to explain the concept of temporal paradoxes. Perhaps he will recognize that his own regular Amoongus might be a paradox itself. If Pokeballs are a relatively new invention, how did this creature know to evolve to mimic it? This predisposition to the concept might make him the explainer as he reprises his narrator role in the DLC's opening sequence. Okay, and before we wrap up, let's look at one last solid shape language speculation. When Clavel is viewed straight on, his chin beard and neckline create six points. Interesting. That could be a star or maybe an abstraction of the compass symbol used by the Paldean Elite Four. Oh, wait a minute. Dang it, Wilkstrom, get out of here. And thus concludes our character design analysis of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's director Clavel. Did we miss anything you caught? Let us know in the comments. Disagree with any of our conclusions? Feel free to articulate the nature of your dissension. Like this video if you want more character design analysis. Feel free to suggest who. Maybe next time we don't do Paldea. Maybe we do Diantha. Or maybe we do Arvin. Maybe Katie. Maybe Brashish. Follow Agna on Instagram and TikTok for short form content and behind the scenes. You should totally subscribe. This is a new channel. Get in on the ground level, folks. We have lots of plans for content. Hot takes on Pokemon who should have their type changed. Underrated gym leaders. Restructuring champion teams. Fake Mon designs and so much more. And not just Pokemon. We're about game design, world building, and digital immersion. So stay tuned for explorations on the magic systems of Avatar The Last Airbender, classic movie monsters, and augmented reality experience design. So hit subscribe to the Ognot YouTube channel so you don't miss what's next.